Welcome back to Dr. Bruce. Introducing a new voice to the Levity Zone, John Suntiger. John is a visual projection artist and community and environmental activist who takes us on his profound life's journey through disease. Disease from childhood to a terrifying hang gliding accident and beyond. John truly paid his dues and has emerged a strong advocate and practitioner of the circle. As Lorenzo Haggerty and I initiated last year with our programs about the life of Terence McKenna, we believe that the time of the mostly white male guru on stage is now, thankfully, being replaced by circles. Circles of sharing, circles of healing, circles of exploration, and circles of the creation of a new world. John has formed a powerful circle in his community and will tell us how that came about and how you might find your own destiny in the circle. As I was winding my way through the back hills and winding country roads of West Virginia, I was on my way to meet some very close friends to tell and share our stories in what we call the Unfolded Stones Healing Circle. As I drove, I thought of how a misdiagnosed childhood illness had altered so much of my life and yet was playing into something so beautiful and worthy of sharing honestly with this small enclave of friends. I thought about my friends, how varied and diverse their trajectories and paths in life were, yet somehow we all related to each other on a primary, almost ancient depth of inherent understanding. This is, of course, the whole purpose of our group, to take a deep dive into our collective experience and mine this for consciousness as a group, to unfold stones that lives as human beings seem intent on dragging around, to let go of the heavy burdens we sometimes latch onto and carry with us almost unwittingly, the psychic detritus that seems to incorporate into people in this world of postmodern and media-driven culture uh, is confusing at least, paralyzing at most, and often carries with it a profound sense of dis-ease. Indeed, the world of modernity seems to have a dripping malaise hanging off of it. I had often thought, what is to be done? Where are clear navigational beacons in this world. This sense has been a companion in my life, and I see it in the lives around me along with its effects as it manifests into our culture, society, and the lives around us. Disease was something I was intimately familiar with in my childhood. Nothing will present a child with a profound sense of it like an actual crippling and handicapping illness. In my case, an actual crippling illness came early and in force. It came in the form of an improperly diagnosed disease to which the treatments could be regarded as worse than the disease itself. In my childhood world, it appeared from a simple tick bite and it was as confounding to me as it was to the doctors. I had been infected with a disease that was not on the books yet. It is not understood even to this day. It was, is, and remains politicized in our ultra-modern, mostly bureaucratic healthcare system. Lyme disease is one such challenge that seems to elude the mainstream scientific material healthcare system. To have a disease such as this as a child instills a world of pain and questions at a very early age. I can remember being surrounded by well-meaning doctors all in white coats, instruments hanging out of their pockets from their necks, a priestly cabal of well-trained, all-knowing professionals. Thinking to myself, do any of these people actually know what is going on? because they certainly didn't seem to, although the words were there. 
my 12 year old mind back then thought they're just guessing wildly they say they understand but in reality they don't they're trying as best they can but for some reason they also can't be honest with me about their limitations the collective training circling around me as a sick child was for all practical purposes an amazing effort of combined disciplines in scientific and medical health yet I always looked at the next new set of eyes cast on me as if to say are you going to be the one that knows someone who understands what's going on inside my mind my body my wrestling of spirit as a child someone who's going to see the whole me instead of a diagnostic puzzle all that knowledge all that experience and I still felt profoundly on my own with this enigma of life or rather the depleting of it while the world looked on and said they're there we understand you just need to tough it out we know what we're doing trust us I did tough it out I turned it over to people in the know but the pain increased and I was thrust from the healthy among us into the realms of there's something seriously wrong with you if you get over it we will welcome you back to the mainstream but for now stay over there in that exile for the diminished in body and mind the marginal those victims of happenstance of illness declare your physical limitations and you will be immediately thrust to the outside seems to be the norm in this society the celebration of physical youthful vigor is almost a religion on the whole our culture and society seems to recoil from disease or differences health means uniformity and a strict delineation of what health is if society and our culture know so much about health why did I feel so unhealthy when exposed to the treatments by our health care system why with the best minds available our most advanced science medicine diagnostics and psychology are we becoming less healthy of mind body and spirit in this modern world certainly as I walk through the world today and I listen to others I mean really listen I find that many relate the same feelings I had as a child pain has multiple dimensions to it and it ingresses into the deep recesses of a life but it also seems to haunt the dimensions of collective life our societal ills seem to be an individual recapitulation of pain and fear into our culture from this we get fear anger discord prejudices politics war and misunderstandings of a collectively large and destructive scale along with this individuated and collective pain we seem to have built an industry of anesthesia in countless forms TV sex competition material worth status fame but among all of them was the culturally accepted anesthesia I found it is a completely acceptable form in this society legal everywhere and a full-on anesthetic if only temporary for the discords of modern life flying hang gliders was one of those things I did to prove something it was something I shouldn't have been able to do but I had a desire to prove something to myself to the world and perhaps to my father who was an Air Force pilot he left during my illness with Lyme and had never really reappeared back into our family life which is not to say that at 25 I still didn't want to prove to him I was no longer a sick child that I had abilities and I could conquer my limitations and participate in this world that he seemed to respect so much the world of aircraft and flying was my father's love and it was an almost singular focus 
the majestic and transcending form of human flight through aircraft, albeit one mostly accomplished by beating the air into submission with technology. Strange was this realization as I plummeted to what was sure to be my own death. I found myself at the apex of a wingtip stall shortly after launching off a uh, training hill. My hang glider was now a projectile and, and I was its hapless cargo. The inevitability of the situation was becoming apparent to me, but another eerie and more apparent certitude set in. I glanced out between the wires of my hang glider, which was now plummeting to earth, rapidly. I saw the parking lot, cars and trucks next to our launch, my various friends, who were now at full gallop for what was sure to be a body recovery effort. I saw a silo, a field, a fence line, and three crosses perched on the hill where my life was certainly and most paradoxically going to end in front of. I thought, now there's a cosmic giggle for you, right, right in front of the crosses. The totality of the landscape I was taking in in this freefall presented me with something else. Because it was exactly the same as a dream I had had a few months before. It makes sense, I thought. Of course, when you're going to die, the universe would at least give you a tad bit of warning just to let you know that there's something more, something capable of being outside time, outside the mere dimension of physicality, something that knows, truly knows beyond the more mundane senses, yet still able to communicate to us. I thought to myself, in freefall, this would have been handy to know before plummeting to my death. Why didn't somebody tell me this? Why didn't somebody tell me in a way that I could have understood? Time dilates in circumstances such as this. It's a lifetime, and it is an instant. And then it's a flash. And the membrane between worlds seems all too easy to cross. When I took my first breath back to the land of the living on that hill, I only needed to look at my friends' faces, uh, and I received from them the message that this is not good. Not good at all. My friends' faces were easily readable, and they were in fact more terrified than I. Helicopter. I heard helicopter. So that means there's still a chance. I spent months recovering. My face was shattered. Reconstruction surgeries ensued. Bills arrived. Employment departed. House foreclosed. Bankruptcy. And a host of immediate arrivals from another bout with the insanely expensive health care system. My life was saved by the medical professionals that day and the su subsequent months that followed. It was later that the other stuff was stripped off as repayment for that debt. The people with the balance sheets and the employer that needed a replacement had no time to wait. They were less caring about the whole tragic affair. My instructions were simply to get better fast, start making money, and do it quickly. It's a weighty affair. And I took it in stride at the time, or so I thought. But again, I had a hot and cold running opiates to squash some of the physical and mental, emotional pain. When the pills ran out, I suddenly developed an affinity for alcohol that I had never had before. I was no stranger to alcohol, but this new development alcohol became my new best friend. It became a anesthetic for everything. Still, I thought of the crash. I felt I had been shown something special that day, yet all whom I shared this with 
shrugged it off as simply interesting, but foolhardy to pay attention to. They did not see what I saw that day. How could they? But without anyone to talk to about this and the intrinsic financial employment and existential crisis boiling up in my life, alcohol became my constant companion, and along with it, another spiral to near death. You never think it can happen to you, but yet by the time it does, it's too late. You don't want to drink, yet every nerve ending in your body is saying send down the liquid relief. I started again to appear in front of the men with white coats. Only this time both of us knew why I was there. I was in the full throes of physical, mental, and psychic addiction. And I was uh, directly in front of the specialists whose primary work was with addiction and recovery. Yet, each of these doctors and specialists I appeared in front of, I recognized the same lack of experiential wisdom that I had recognized from my bout with Lyme disease in my childhood. Each one, I recognized, had zero clue, zero relatability, zero experience of being in it, no direct understanding. All of their methods, all of their pills, all of their suggestions were merely informal guesses or treatment regimens read from books for something they lacked all crucial experience of. Here's another confounding, and we find this throughout our healthcare system. For all its advancements, our understanding and treatment of illnesses, addictions, and psyches, it is sorely lacking. And by lacking, I mean in some of the most fundamental foundations of understanding. I stopped drinking hundreds upon hundreds of times. I went through all the life-threatening potentials that detoxing from alcohol presents, all the convolutions of trying to stop, even seizures at times. All of this to no avail. And like on that hang glider, I was caught in a plummeting fall for which no recovery was going to be vouchsafed. Unless, unless I could find someone who was there, who had experiential wisdom, had walked out of this doom, whose footsteps I could place mine in trustingly to start a walk out of my own doom. All of these doctors seemed unequipped in the world of experiential wisdom here. Nothing they said fired my attention or could relate to me that they understood and instill in me a trust uh, to do what was required. However... I read an account of something I immediately recognized on a very intuitional and experiential level. It was an account of what can only be termed a shamanic experience. And it was brought on by a last-ditch effort to save the spirit and heart of a dying man, a dying alcoholic. I read this man's account of his vision and I recognized direct similarities to the threads of experience and happenstance in my life. His experiences recounted the more esoteric and ethereal realms of energy, psyche, and spirit that mirrored flashes of recognition inside me. He knew, and I knew he knew. I recognized the domain that elucidated his understanding from my life and hard-won direct experience. This was his deliverance and that of countless hundreds of thousands from addiction. And it was so simple. From that one vision this man had, and others, 
they have recounted in innumerable ways their recovery and it became an entry point for the recovery of millions caught in the throes of addiction. It was also their participation in their own healing and the healing of others. All of this mined from a single shamanic experience and expanded upon in ever-increasing circles of healing through sharing. The man that I'm talking about was Bill Wilson of AA fame. And while it is not widely known, the first experience or vision that this man had was brought on by indigenous medicine. The anonymous circles of healing and recovery that had come from this man's vision, also combined with others, was and is something to take note of. Noteworthy beyond the singular focus of healing from addiction. That one vision, as it related to recovery from addiction, to be of service, to heal, and to be healed. For AA, that circled the world faster than the web sprawled its communicative structure around it. There's controversy in AA. Modern medicine is still trying to analyze how it in fact works. And of course the fact that Bill Wilson uh, did LSD for uh, some period and actually recommended it as a tool for recovery from addiction. And the labeling of it as a faith-based method is misunderstood if not entirely misrepresented in the general culture but around all of this is something else amazing and I mean truly amazing because it operates on the level of intuitive healing in direct experience through this simple act of coming together the shared experience of healing is not limited to one social, societal or individual ill it's applicable to all of them and to all people. This simple act is not without precedent. It is not a new discovery. This form of supportive healing has been around for ages. It is in the tribal societies where interdependence, cohesiveness, the support of the tribe, rearing of children, reconciliation of differences, teaching, understanding, even survival is required by cohesiveness in this manner. It was in the salons of ancient Greece and even the virtual salons of today's hyperconnected internet. It was carried through the muses of ancient gatherings and artistic expression, ecstatic dance. This form of healing ingresses naturally anywhere a gathering of honest intent and direct experience through sharing exists. Ram Dass, once known as Richard Alpert, friends with the notable psychedelic mind Timothy Leary, he set off from the melee of the 60s to India as a means to explore these methods of ancient mystical techniques and healing. He too found alchemical gold in this territory. Later, after he penned a book called Be Here Now, he was fond of saying to packed houses of interested explorers, all we need to do is be together and it will all happen. It will all happen. Also, another quote, everything in your life is there as a vehicle for your transformation. Use it. Another notable mind who explored indigenous and tribal relationships with medicines and healing, Terence McKenna. He said, find the others and return to first principles. From his work, An Archaic Revival, he stated, more and more I recognize the practice of indigenous rainforest shamanism was a form of group consciousness and finally after Bill Wilson's initial alchemical shamanic vision had taken hold 
and circled the world as a method to recover from addiction. Among the other benefits, he said, Most of us feel we need look no further for utopia. We have it here with us, right here and now. Each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. This is what I found myself on the road driving to. Driving through the mountains to quite literally find and be with others. To be together. To sit in this ever-widening circle of healing. To heal. To sit. To share not just the specificity of illness such as Bill Wilson's anonymous phenomenological program but in a wider sense a much wider sense I have found through many years of sitting in these circles that it is a conversation in an ancient healing language I did not know I had remembered this language. It is a highly communicative language, and it is a language beyond words. It works collectively and through us, through multiple dimensions of human understanding, emotion, heart, spirit, psyche, mind, experience levels. And it is through this coming together and relating our shared experiences that we're able to dive underneath the cultural detritus that our world presents us with and get to the heart and core of who and what we are. It's here where we discover how to relate on a primary level, on a level that is tangible in our lives and the lives directly around us. Our reflections of each other paint a cohesive picture and it crosses the boundaries that seem to separate us. The one thing about this world today is we all seem to be profoundly separate and that causes a great deal of pain. But if we can sit together in relationship and we can find the places where we are not separate, we build relationship, we build likeness, we see that we are profoundly the same and that we have relationship with each other on a very deep level. But not just with with each other. We have this relationship with the nature of the world that we find ourselves in. Between the natural world. Between the tree, the sky, the mountain. We're always in relationship in this spiral of being inexorably tied together in this miracle of life. So it's in this circle of relationship we hold our conversations. And this form of communion with each other and the world is most magical. I mean, by magic, I mean it in the truest sense of the word. Because here's where it all happens. It all just happens. Anyone, and I mean anyone, can start a circle with this archaic and natural foundation. There are no guardians at the gate, no priests with white coats, no dogmatic religions, no decades of institutional schooling required. There are also no entrance fees, no medical bills. There is only a calling to come together and to heal ourselves and be of service to each other. 
We only need to be open-minded and approach each other honestly with who and what we are. The inherent credentials that we need to do this are already built inside us because they are our life experience. They are the trajectories of our lives that we can share with others. And from these local correlation points, we learn who we are collectively and in individuated creative expression. There is nothing so magical and healing as what can come through this simple act of sharing with each other. If I could relay one lesson in my life, the most important one, it would be this. Find the others. Find each other. Share your experiences. Share your hopes, your dreams, sicknesses, and health. And just be together. Just be together. And it all happens. It all just happens. This has been another episode of Dr. Bruce. Find this and other podcasts as well as a raft of other material and user-contributed gems at drbruce.org. Feel free to send us your voice, your music, your images, and your movies for us to mix into future episodes. And grab all of our content and freely mix it into your own projects under our Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike 3.0 license. 